When a variable is measured in a scale consisting of exactly two categories, the resulting data are called binomial. The term binomial can be loosely translated as two names, referring to the two categories in the measurement scale. Binomial data can occur when a variable naturally exists with only two categories. For example, people can be classified as male or female, and a coin toss results in either heads or tails. It's also common for a researcher to simplify data by collapsing the scores into two categories. For example, a psychologist may use personality scores to classify people as either high or low aggression. The binomial distribution is often used in genetic counselling. For example, Tay-Sachs disease is a metabolic disorder that is inherited as an autosomal recessive trait. Both recessive alleles are necessary for expression of the disease. Inheritance of a disorder such as Tay-Sachs disease follows a binomial distribution. There are two possible events, inheriting the disease or not inheriting the disease. Both are mutually exclusive. A person can't both have the disease and not have it at the same time. And these two possibilities are independent of each other. A physician could therefore use the binomial distribution to inform a couple who are carriers of the disease and that have three children what the probabilities of the following are. That all three children develop Tay-Sachs, that only one child develops Tay-Sachs, or that the third child develops Tay-Sachs, given that the first two did not. In binomial situations, the researcher often knows the probabilities associated with each of the two categories. For example, with a balanced coin, the probability of getting heads is 0.5, and the probability of getting tails is also 0.5. The number of times each category occurs in a series of trials, or in a sample of individuals, is usually the question of interest. For example, what's the probability of obtaining 15 heads in 20 coin tosses? Or what's the probability of obtaining more than 40 introverts in a sample of 50 college freshmen? Or what's the probability of at least 12 patients recovering out of 20 who have contracted a stomach disease? To answer probability questions about binomial data, we need to examine the binomial distribution to define and describe this distribution, we first introduce some notation. The two categories are identified as A and B. The probabilities or proportions associated with each category are identified as P brackets A, which is the probability of A, and Q brackets B, the probability of B. Notice that P plus Q equals 1 because A and B are the only two possible outcomes. The number of individuals or observations in the sample are identified by n, and the variable x refers to the number of times category A occurs in the sample. x can have any value from 0, which means that none of the sample is in category A, to n, which means that all of the sample is in category A. To construct a binomial distribution, we'll look at all the possible outcomes from tossing a coin twice. The complete set of four outcomes is listed below. The probability of getting two heads is 1 in 4, while the probability of getting one head and one tail is 1 in 2, and the probability of getting two tails is 1 in 4. Drawing the binomial distribution from the previous example, we get this figure. The binomial distribution can be used to answer probability questions. For example, What's the probability of obtaining at least one head in two coin tosses? According to the distribution, the answer is 3 out of 4. These binomial distributions show the probability for the number of heads in two tosses, 8 tosses, 16 tosses, and 64 tosses of a balanced coin. It should be obvious from the graphs here that binomial distributions tend towards a normal distribution shape especially when the sample size n is relatively large. The binomial distribution tends to approximate the normal distribution as n gets large, or more precisely as p times n and q times n are greater than 10. Under these circumstances, 
The binomial distribution will approximate the normal distribution with the following parameters. The mean equals p times n and the standard deviation equals the square root of n times p times q. This means that given p, q and n we can directly derive z-scores using this formula. The fact that the binomial distribution tends to be normal in shape means that we can compute probability values directly from z-scores in the unit normal table. It's important to remember that the normal distribution is only an approximation of a true binomial distribution. Binomial values are discrete, but the normal distribution is continuous. However, the normal approximation provides an extremely accurate model for computing binomial probabilities in many situations. This figure shows the difference between the binomial distribution, which is always a discrete histogram, and the normal distribution, which is a continuous smooth curve. Although the two distributions are slightly different, the area under the distributions is nearly equivalent. It's the area under the distributions that is used to find probabilities. Let's go through some examples. Example 9. Using a balanced coin, what's the probability of obtaining more than 30 heads in 50 coin tosses? The first thing to do is to write down the information for P, Q, N and X. The probability of getting a head is 0 0.5 and the probability of getting a tail is also 0 0.5. Our n number is 50 because we're doing 50 coin tosses, but what about our x value? To get the maximum accuracy when using the normal approximation, you need to remember that each x value is a bar bounded by real limits. So x equals 30 is everything from x equals 29.5 to 30.5. The problem asks us about the probability of obtaining more than 30 heads. So we need to use the upper real limit of 30 for our x value, which is 30.5. Next we need to figure out the mean and the standard deviation. The mean equals p times n, or 0 0.5 times 50, which equals 25. The standard deviation is the square root of n times p times q, which equals the square root of 12.5, which is 3.54. Then we're going to calculate a z-score value. So 30.5 minus 25 divided by 3.54, which equals 1.55. Looking up this z-score of 1.55 in the unit normal table and reading across the column C, the probability is 0.0606, or 6.06%. Example 10. A friend bets you that you can draw a king at least 9 times in 20 draws with replacement from a fair deck of cards, and he does it. Is this a likely outcome, or should you conclude that the deck is not fair, and that your friend is cheating? Again, the first thing to do is to figure out the P, Q, N, and X information. The probability of choosing a king is 4 out of 52, or 0 0.077 while the probability of choosing any other card is 48 out of 52, or 0 0.923. Our n number is 20, and the x value that we're going to use is 8.5. The problem asks us to determine the probability for at least 9 times, so we need to include 9, anything 9 or above in other words. In order to do that we need to use the lower real limit for the value 9, which is 8.5. Then we're going to calculate the mean and the standard deviation. So the mean equals p times n, which is 0 0.077 times 20, which equals 1.54. The standard deviation is the square root of n times p times q, which equals the square root of 1.42, which equals 1.19. We're then going to convert this information into a z-score. So z equals 8.5 minus 1.54 divided by 1.19, which equals 5.85. Try to look up z equals 5.85 in the unit normal table, but it's not there. This means that the probability is essentially zero. In other words, 
your friend is cheating. It's very unlikely to obtain an individual from the original population who has a z-score beyond plus or minus 1.96. Less than 5% of any population fit into this area under the curve. Therefore, we classify an event as being unlikely to happen by chance. In other words, it's more likely to have had a deliberate cause if it is a less than 5% probability of occurring in a normal population. What the card magician did in example 10 was very unlikely. The probability was less than 5%. But the coin flip from example 9 can still be explained by chance. The probability is greater than 5%. Example 11. A new surgical procedure has a success rate of P equals 0 0.6. If the operation is performed five times, what's the probability that less than two are successful? Again, we need to first figure out P, Q, N, and X. So the probability of success is 0 0.6. This means that the probability of failure, Q, equals 0 0.4. We know this because P and Q always add up to one. Our N number is five, and the X value that we need to use is 1.5. This is because the question asks us for the probability that less than 2 are successful. So we need to use the lower real limit of 2. Then we're going to find the mean and the standard deviation. So the mean equals p times n, or 0 0.6 times 5, which equals 3. The standard deviation is the square root of n times p times q, which equals the square root of 1.2, which is 1.1. Using this information to calculate a z-score, we get z equals 1.5 minus 3 divided by 1.1, which equals negative 1.36. Looking up 1.36 in the unit normal table and looking at column C, we get proportion of 0.0869, or 8.69%. That's the probability that less than two of the operations out of five are successful. Example 12. Let's stick with the same problem, but this time ask the question, what's the probability that exactly 4 out of 5 surgical procedures are successful? Again, we need to find P, Q, N and X. So the probability of success is again 0 0.6 and the probability of failure, Q, is still 0 0.4. N is 5 and this time we need to use two X values. 3.5 and 4.5 because we're trying to find the probability of exactly 4 which is bounded by the lower real limit of 3.5 and the upper real limit of 4.5. Our mean and our standard deviation information are the same but this time we need to calculate two z-scores. The first z-score is 3.5 minus 3 divided by 1.1 which gives us a z-score of 0.45. Looking up z equals 0 0.45 in the unit normal table and looking to column c, we get a proportion of 0 0.3264. Our second z-score value equals 4.5 minus 3 divided by 1.1, which is 1.36. Looking up z equals 1.36 in the unit normal table and looking to column c gives us a probability of 0 0.0869. Next, it's best if you make a rough sketch and shade the area that you're trying to find. So the area between the two scores is 0 0.3264 minus 0 0.0869, which equals 0 0.2395, or 23.95%. This is the probability that exactly four of the five operations are successful. So far, we've considered the probability of obtaining single outcomes for given events. It's often necessary to calculate the probability of two or more outcomes for a given event. How we calculate probabilities for multiple outcomes depends on the relationship between each outcome. The addition rule of probability states that the probability of any one of several particular events occurring is equal to the sum of their individual probabilities, provided that the events are mutually exclusive i.e. they cannot both happen. For example, the probability that someone in the human population has an AB blood type 
is roughly 0.08, while the probability for O-type blood is roughly 0.25. The outcomes type AB and type O blood are mutually exclusive. An individual can't have both blood types at the same time. But we can use the addition rule to find the probability that, that a person has either type AB or O type blood. This probability is 0 0.08 plus 0 0.25, which equals 0 0.33, or in other words, 33%. The multiplication rule of probability states that the probability of two or more statistically independent events all occurring is equal to the product of their individual probabilities. For example, the lifetime probability of a person developing cancer is p equals 0 0.25, and the lifetime probability of developing schizophrenia is p equals 0 0.01. The outcomes, developing cancer or schizophrenia, are independent of each other. In other words, having one illness neither increases nor decreases the risk of having the other. We can use the multiplication rule to find the lifetime probability that a person might have both cancer and schizophrenia. This probability is 0 0.25 times 0 0.01, which equals 0 0.0025, or in other words, 0.25%.